left for a for San Diego chapter of ACC. Welcome everyone to today's webinar on decoding responsible AI governance. I want to thank Dentons for sponsoring this MCLE. And I think you're all in for a real treat today. I heard Peter present on a similar topic during our all day MCLE, and it was definitely one of the favorite sessions that I attended. Peter Stockberger is the managing partner of Denton San Diego office. He's a member of the firm's venture technology and emerging growth companies group, and also the co-lead of the firm's autonomous vehicle practice. He is the lead for all things AI at Denton. So with that, I will turn it over to Peter. Great, thanks a lot, John. And, and thank you everybody for tuning in today for what I hope is going to be a very practical uh, discussion about what is probably on all of your plates right now. And that is, how do you leverage AI and mitigate risk? And what's all the buzz about AI? And are we sort of walking into a cliff or is this all a big hype cycle? And so I think you know the goal for today is really to uh, break down what it means to implement responsible AI, which is the buzzword right now amongst all the regulators. Uh, so before we get into it, though, I want, I'm going to set the table with a bit of definitions about what we're talking about when we talk about AI. What is the promise? What is the peril? And that phrase, promise and peril, uh, appears to be the, the phrase of the day. The White House in their new executive order used it. So that, that promise and peril is really the two-edged sword that we're dealing with. I'll break down for you how it's actually being regulated globally right now, both uh, internationally as well as in the US, and then really get into the meat of what is responsible AI governance, whether it's the federal government, the White House through their new executive order, the EU, or even the California state government. Most legislators and regulators are now coalescing around this idea that for organizations to use AI in a lawful manner, they need to do so responsibly. So we'll break down what that concept is. And then I'm gonna give you actual examples. What does that look like in practice from uh, compliance programs we've built for other organizations and just show you this is actually doable. It's not just an esoteric concept, but responsible in action. I'll show you some contract language examples, some vendor diligence questions and some tips around internal guardrails. I, Hopefully this will be an interactive discussion, so don't save your questions for the end. If you do have questions throughout, feel free to pop them in the chat box. I'll monitor that throughout and make sure we've, we're answering questions as they go along. Any discussion around AI uh, has to begin with basic definitional terms because not everybody's working on the same background about AI. And so that's one of the most important questions is what are we talking about when we're talking about artificial intelligence? Well, this definition comes directly from the White House's new executive order on AI, which is a definition that we've seen come through various agencies and regulatory bodies. But AI at its core is a machine-based system, so a computer program, that can make predictions, recommendations, or decisions that influence real or virtual environments. And I always break it down to it's a system that can augment human intelligence. So it can give recommendations, it can make predictions, it can look at patterns of data. That's AI as a baseline. And we've been using AI for years. If you think about doing any search on Westlaw or Lexis, that's a form of a machine-based system making recommendations that influence the real environment of lawyers doing legal research. So AI as a concept has been around for a while. Machine learning is another phrase that you will often hear and see in documentation and recommendations. And machine learning is a form of AI, it's a technique that is used to train algorithms to improve their performance for particular tasks. So machine learning looks for relationships and patterns. The generative artificial intelligence tools that are making all the news, uh, let's say ChatGPT, it's a form of machine learning. It's looking for patterns in data and generating recommendations and output. Deep learning is a form of machine learning that is even more complicated and basically relies on a layered network of neural networks. Uh, think of it like the brain. It's multiple layers of networks processing information, 
exchanging information about relationships and deep learning is where there's a lot of promise right now, for example, in the healthcare space, in the financial space, to be able to process large volumes of data, look for relationships and actually uh, produce results that resemble how a human brain uh, would function. And so with AI, machine learning, and deep learning, we have generative AI. And generative AI is a new class of AI that really came onto the market in November of last year. And this form of AI is trained on extremely large volumes of data, trillions of pieces of data. And it's structured to emulate the data, the characteristics of data you enter into it to generate synthetic data as a result. So you input a question, it goes out to its historic data, looks at all the data points, calculates from a mathematical perspective, what's the next likely word in the response to this question and generates synthetic audio, video, pictures, and other dig digital media. That generative AI is what came on the market last year and has really accelerated the public discourse about AI, its use, and how it should be regulated. So if AI has been around for a while, the key question is why is there so much attention on it now? What about generative AI is, is generating all of this discussion? And, and it's important to recognize that although AI is not new, what is new is the rate of its acceleration. It's pretty remarkable to think about that this generative AI phenomenon came online in November of last year. It's one, it's 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 about 12 months old. And it's already generated such a buzz and generated new and, and incredible commercial opportunities. A recent survey estimated that AI could add 17 and 26 trillion dollars annually to the global economy because of its proliferation. And the rate of acceleration, a way to think about it, is if you put a snowball on the top of a hill and you said you can only accelerate 30 times your size uh, and get 30 times your size, well, it would reach a cap. And I don't know what 30 times the size of a snowball would be, but it's maybe a boulder. But AI is accelerating at an infinite rate. Therefore, there is no cap on acceleration. It continues to accelerate and learn. Therefore, a snowball with infinite acceleration very quickly can reach the size of Mars. So that's the promise and the peril of AI at the moment is that although it appears new, it is accelerating at a rate that we haven't seen other technology. So there's great promise in that acceleration because we will see decades of advancements in certain industries within years, but there is also great risk with that advancement because of the level of processing and potential implications in various areas. So what are these generative AI tools? This just gives you a snapshot. They're commercially available now. We've got a, a number of chatbots on the market and these you can use right now on your phone or, or your personal device, type in questions, get answers. Uh, for example, ChatGPT has a new version that where you can pay to compare documents. Uh, I was comparing two PDFs of two documents where people were giving me receipts, and this is for personal use, receipts in one document and invoices in the other. I uploaded them both. It spat out an analysis and generated a new Word document for me to work off of. So really remarkable capabilities, these chatbots, and they can generate audio, they can generate video, they can generate text. What we're increasingly seeing, though, are enterprise tools. And these are tools being offered by Microsoft, IBM, Adobe, OpenAI. And these enterprise tools sit on top of your data as an organization and provide the generative AI capability. So for example, Microsoft Copilot, uh, they released it to the public on November 1st. And what this tool does is it sits on top of your Microsoft Office 365 environment, and it allows users to use generative AI to generate new text, new audio. So oftentimes you see in the demo of Copilot, if this were a meeting on Microsoft Teams, and we were talking about, well, after this meeting, here are some key takeaways. Let's generate a slide deck. Let's get a new time on the calendar. Copilot actually will generate the slide deck, will organize everyone's calendar. The promise of it is that it reduces all the administrative headache. And these tools are pretty remarkable in their capabilities. 
There is a lot of risk though with these tools generally because you're giving access to your data, you're giving access to your company sensitive information, but they are out there. They hold a lot of promise. And if your organization isn't already looking at these tools, they will, or you will be charged with looking at these tools in the very near future. And so we've got a tremendous potential of application in a number of industries. We see education, schools, public schools, private schools now using generative AI tools to help students study. There was one recent study showing that using generative AI in, uh, in the education space can increase educational outcomes for students who do not have access to individual tutors. So the AI becomes the tutor for the student. We see AI being used in employment very frequently. A recent survey by the Society of HR Managers showed that 80% of employers are using some form of AI in recruitment. Uh, these are tools that are built into your current HR systems, but they're also commercially available that can scan resumes, conduct interviews, drive feedback uh, based on those interviews all through AI. That type of use case is getting a lot of scrutiny because of potentials for discriminatory outcomes if those AIs are not trained on diverse data sets. Healthcare is another industry that we are just seeing AI explode. I work with a number of hospital systems that are really leveraging AI right now on the operational side. So new patient intake, generating responses by doctors to patients, AI is being used across the healthcare space. The real promise of AI in healthcare is on the clinical side and diagnostic side. For example, I heard one expert say, say that if AI was released on all publicly, all personal health information, all cancer diagnoses, all CT scans, that it could cure cancer in a week. Now, I don't know if that's hyperbole, but the promise of it is it can look for patterns and relationships that human beings can't see. And so, for example, Microsoft has released a, a product available in the healthcare space that allows doctors to run CT scans against millions of other scans, looking for patterns in cancer diagnoses that a human doctor wouldn't see. Some of the challenges we see in the healthcare space, though, are some healthcare medical malpractice insurance providers are saying, if you use AI in the delivery of healthcare, we're not going to cover you for malpractice. Healthcare systems are also worried if we don't use AI in delivering healthcare, our patient's going to sue us for malpractice. So a lot of difficult legal issues in the healthcare space. Insurance is seeing a lot of applications and scrutiny around determining rates, determining coverage, all of anything that's knowledge-based. Uh, AI has a lot of promise in insurance. Construction, we're seeing it in developing building plans and actually carrying out several processes within construction, and the public sector, using it across government, both at the local, state, and federal level is a real focus right now. So a lot of applications across multiple sectors, we could spend a whole webinar just going through some of these really innovative ways that AI is impacting sectors. But the reason we're all here is we wanna prevent the risks associated with this. Whatever sector you are in, whatever your organization, uh, their posture in the marketplace is, using AI, comes with risk at the moment, the way the current AI tools are built. One of the key risks is accuracy. If you are relying on a, an AI tool to generate content, to generate information, to generate video, audio, text, is it accurate, the result? And we probably have all read the story about the attorney in New York who used ChatGPT to pull up cases to support a brief in a New York court proceeding. ChatGPT generated five cases. They all turned out to be made up. They didn't exist, but they were full citations, pin sites, very descriptive outlines of what the cases ruled on, submitted it with the brief. Court came back and said, we can't find these. And the attorney had to file a declaration saying, well, it looks like they were made up. Now that's an accuracy problem with the, with the current version of the tool that he was using. If he, and we'll talk about this later in terms of responsible governance, if there was a human in the loop that checked, site checked those cases, then it probably wouldn't have been a problem. I use ChatGPT sometimes just out of curiosity. I'll say, what's the most restrictive state financial data privacy law? And, and it pulled up a Vermont regulation that would have taken me forever to find on Westlaw. Its summary of the regulation turned out to be wrong. 
but the regulation itself was correct. So I was able to jump off of it and go research. So accuracy continues to be a problem with a lot of these tools. Now, companies that offer these tools are promising, well, the enterprise version of our tool is more accurate because it's your data going in and analysis coming out on your data. It's not going out, it's not hallucinating, it's not pulling data from the internet. Privacy is another issue, and this is an issue that the FTC is very focused on at the moment, so are international privacy regulators. And the issues around privacy are twofold. One, some of these AI tools are pulling data from the internet. That's part of their data set that they were trained on. And there are some lawsuits pending arguing that that was an invasion of privacy of anybody whose data was pulled as a result of that training. The privacy issue that the FTC is focused on is they've launched an investigation into OpenAI, for example, saying that OpenAI in training ChatGPT going out, it pulled data from minors, from children under the age of 13, and therefore did not align with certain protections under federal law. And the global regulators are concerned about data minimization standards that are not being deployed if you use some of these AI tools. So your privacy posture, your privacy risk can increase by using these tools. IP protection really is the area that we're seeing a lot of action in the courts right now. Multiple lawsuits are pending by artists, movie stars, authors against these large language model companies alleging that when I go in and type in, write me a story about Middle Earth, the Game of Thrones author, for example, sued, has filed a lawsuit alleging that these large language models stole his copywritten stories about Game of Thrones, and they use that to generate this new story that I use to tell my kid a bedtime story. I don't, I probably shouldn't be telling him a bedtime story about Game of Thrones, but you get my, you get my point. These copyright lawsuits are still pending. There's a lot of debate about whether it's fair use or what's the impact. But for, for an organization, the risk, I'll give you an example, is if your marketing department uses a generative AI tool to generate images and you out in your public facing marketing materials, you're using these generated images and the company that you use the image from got sued for federal copyright infringement, a federal judge ruled in their favor. And now the image that you have out there in your marketing material, was it generated in violation of federal copyright law? So that's where the, the thorny issues of IP protection and copyright law are still being worked out. We don't have an answer as to where the law is going to fall on this. Discrimination is another area that presents pretty significant risk right now, especially in any area of the law where discrimination is prohibited. So employment, finance, and housing, those are pretty common examples. But in the employment space, we see the EEOC and other state regulators in California. The California Civil Rights Division is focused on this in that if you use an AI tool that was not trained on a diverse set of data, is it going to result in a discriminatory outcome? If it does, does that violate the ADA, Title VII, or FIHA in California? So another area of law that's really shaping up. I think vendor management right now is where you face a lot of the risk and AI because most, most companies are not building their own generative AI tool. That's changing because it's becoming more available, but most companies using AI are signing up a vendor, signing up a new tool to use AI. And those new tools present risk because you don't have full visibility into how those tools are operating. So we're gonna talk about how to manage that risk um, toward the end of the presentation, but I think vendor management right now is an area that can present immediate risk. And then ultimately, anything being used that can impact human safety, regulators are really focused right now on those applications, medical care, housing, using it for construction. So physical safety is a, is a real focus. And if you're using it in that space, you've got to watch out for uh, th these issues. A question came up in the chat about who owns the prompts when you actually type into the tool, X, Y, Z, who owns that prompt and then who owns the response? And the answer is it depends on the tool you're using and depends on the how much you're paying for the tool. So in some of these tools, when you look at the terms of use for the public facing tools, the vendor themselves, the, the provider of the software owns it. If you look at the enterprise tools, sometimes those terms will say, you company own the prompt, 
but the software provider owns the right to train its algorithm based on your prompt. So you have to be careful about what goes into the prompt, uh, that you're not putting in anything that's sensitive, that's trade secret, that's private into the prompt. So the devil's in the details on those terms with all these software providers, which is not a new risk for organizations. It's, it's, it's a software risk. You have to make sure you look at the terms of use before you use it. So the promise and the peril is significant. And there are a lot of folks who think we're just on a on a hype cycle for AI at the moment. And this is uh, a, a hype cycle chart that Gartner uh, published that is pretty widely discussed nowadays. And this is the hype cycle for AI, according to Gartner. And, and where we are right now is we've gone over the innovation trigger. We've gotten over the peak of inflated expectations. There's been a trough of dis disillusionment. And now we're moving toward uh, a plateau of productivity. I actually think that there are more there there are there are going to be more tools and more developments in AI in the next few years beyond generative AI. I think generative AI is the tip of the iceberg in terms of what AI will offer. But this gives you a sense that there is some skepticism in the marketplace. And I I actually think the future of AI. This is my personal opinion is not going to be the siloed generative AI tools, AI tools just sitting out in the marketplace. But instead, AI is going to increasingly network and be increasingly in the background of all of our lives. It's going to be running in every piece of software, behind every tool. Computers, uh, Microsoft's, I believe, CEO was just saying this week that their new AI tool is going to change how personal computing is done. The, the operating system is going to go away. You're going to have your own intelligent agent that communicates with other intelligent agents, forming this ecosystem of AI. And ultimately what that's gonna take us from is from artificial narrow intelligence where we are today, which are very particular models that perform very particular tasks very well, to artificial general intelligence, which are gonna be this ecosystem of agents operating independently that feel very much like interacting with a human being. And these artificial general intelligence, AGI, is where AI will have rational thought, be making judgments. That is what most people in AI right now, the leaders in AI, are working on. They're working on the trajectory to AGI. When you read their mission statements, they are focused on AGI. Generative AI tools right now are in the narrow category. So that's why I think a lot of the discussion around generative AI is, is important, but the trajectory of AI is going to be different. And then artificial superintelligence is what we think about when we think about Terminator 2 and uh, the singularity and the AI taking over the world. This is quite far off still, but the trajectory is there. We can see it in that AI will increasingly become more intelligent and will be more intelligent than human beings. And so what it does is it, it raises a very interesting question of how do we govern these systems? And I, this is just to give you an example that we're, we're, we're on this trajectory right now of AI from automatic, which is like sliding doors at the airport, to automated, which we see in factories, to autonomous, which we're seeing right now on the roadways with autonomous vehicles. We're going to get to the stage where AI actually thinks for itself, operates for itself. Autonomous, uh, in the Greek sort of root of the word, is self-governing. So the ultimate question I think for the future is how do you govern a system that's on a path to governing itself? What does that regulation look like? How does society address that? I will not pretend to answer that question on this webinar. <laughs> that is the ultimate question I think that will face all of us as a society. And if you would like a, our thoughts on it, we did, we did a white paper on this exact issue of how do you regulate AI in the future? But today, the issue is, how do you ensure that your use of AI is responsible? Because that's what the regulators are focused on. They are having these discussions on the broader trajectory of AI, but they're really focused on what are the risks today for an organization. So before I jump into what does it mean to engage in AI responsibly, what does AI responsible governance look like, I want to give you a quick snapshot of where we are with AI regulation. To give you a sense, there are over 800 proposals globally to regulate AI. So I'm only gonna be skimming the top here in terms of what's being discussed, but I'm gonna give you the, the high level points. At the global level, 
We do see a growing consensus about the need for coordinated AI regulation. Because of the power of the tool, uh, there are a number of states that are interested in doing this in a coordinated way. Last week, uh, the United Kingdom hosted the AI Safety Summit, where 28 countries signed on to what's called the Bletchley Declaration, declaring an intent to take a coordinated approach to AI regulation. Whether that actually happens remains to be seen. You know, it was a pretty watered down declaration. But as far as international declarations go, first of its kind around AI, the UN has formed an AI advisory group. So there is international energy behind this. What we see at the global level, though, is we see, I think, AI regulation breaking down into three buckets. One is a risk-based approach. And this is the model that's being adopted right now in the EU in the draft EU AI Act. And you're probably seeing a lot of headlines about this first of its kind law that would govern all nation states in the EU. It is in a draft form. It's the subject of very extensive negotiations at the moment about what it's gonna look like. But in the end, if the current draft takes form, it's a risk-based approach. It is saying if, if your use of AI is in a high-risk environment, it could be banned. If your AI is in a medium risk environment, it must satisfy these controls. If it's a low risk environment, we don't really care. High risk is stuff like healthcare, education, finance. And so we see this kind of risk base based on sector approach in the EU. Canada is following the same approach in their draft EU AOC. Brazil's following that approach. So you're starting to see more countries adopt this risk based approach. And in the US, we have several lawmakers who are endorsing this concept. They're saying, we should do what Europe's doing, go with a risk-based approach. The challenge with a risk-based approach is that it can be very narrow at times because you are only including in that regulatory framework what you know that AI is capable of doing in the moment. And we've already seen a challenge here because when they drafted the EU AI Act, generative AI was only in its infancy. And since then, they've had to reamend the AI Act to reflect the power of the generative AI tools, showing the acceleration of the technology drove immediate change into a draft bill. And currently, there's been some news about stall. There's been a stall in the tri-party negotiations over the EU AI Act because the generative AI provisions are too restrictive. And so we have countries like France and Germany saying, hold up, well, maybe we don't agree with this because this could stifle innovation. So you can see there's, there's challenges in a risk-based approach because it can become dated quickly. Other jurisdictions like the UK and, and others within Asia and Southeast Asia are following a lighter touch market-driven approach. So the UK has said, we're going to leave it up to each regulatory sector, banking, employment, to work with industry to figure out what the right balance is between regulation and market-based uh, self-regulation. That obviously has its challenges and its, and its benefits as well. And the third bucket is kind of unique to China, which is very central management. China's already released several very specific, very centrally managed AI regulations. Those are the three buckets we see the global community moving in. The U.S. is a bit of a moving target, though, at the moment. And the U.S., there's a lot happening at the federal and state level, but I'm, I'm going to give you the highlights because I think it, it gives you a sense of why in the U.S. and in California, this concept of responsible AI governance is starting to take shape as the legal standard for organizations. At the federal level, we do not yet, and I say yet because they're working on it, have a federal AI law. That said, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced earlier this year that he was going to hold AI learning sessions within the Senate and start to develop an AI legal framework that is developed in a way that's different than other legislation because the technology is different. So we're going to act different. Again, we'll believe it when we see it because it's U.S. Congress and we'll see how quickly they can move. We do have several bills pending at the Senate and House level. Probably the most interesting one that has gotten the most attention is a licensing regime that was presented by Senator Blumenthal and Senator Hawley, a bipartisan proposal that essentially proposed to regulate large language models, large AI providers, like the FAA regulates airlines, saying if you want to operate your AI within federal jurisdiction, you need a license from a new licensing agency. 
So that got a lot of buzz and a lot of attention. Obviously, that's very complicated. It's also very narrowly focused on scale, AIs that are large. And the future of AI, going back to that slide around the ecosystems, is that AI is actually, the future of it is might be very small AIs, millions of small AIs operating in an ecosystem. Scale may not actually be the future of AI. And we're already hearing that from some of the large language model companies saying, scaling may not be the answer. And in fact, networking and creating more nimble agents may be. So we'll see what the current federal approach is, where, what direction they head in. The White House, though, has really been the leader at the federal level on AI policy. And this began last year when the White House released the blueprint for AI uh, rights, where it said companies using AI should align with certain principles. And that's where we start to see the responsibility approach coming in. Uh, the White House has instructed federal agencies throughout the year to analyze AI in their respective legal regimes from an equity and equitable perspective. And most importantly, we have a new executive order that was issued on October 30th on AI. It's, a, it's 111 pages long. Uh, it talks about what the policy of the federal government is going to be from a federal agency use of AI perspective. So it tells agencies to develop their own AI policy, to be responsible in the use of AI, directs OMB to develop a federal AI use policy for federal agencies, it also directs the Department of Commerce's National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is NIST, to develop more standards and guidelines for industry around AI risk management and to work on the development of global technical standards. So the White House is really out front on this. And it's not, it's not really the first time the White House has gotten involved. We had the Department of Commerce's NIST released an AI risk management framework in, in January of this year which has really been driving this conversation. And NIST endorsed a responsibility framework within that risk management system. Since that time in April, for example, we saw multiple federal agencies come out and say, even though we don't have a federal AI law, we are going to enforce our existing legal regimes against AI. So companies be on notice. FTC says, don't overhype the use of AI. Don't overpromise it. We're gonna hold you accountable. Uh, we've had some enforcement orders from the FTC actually ordering disgorgement of models and data as a punishment uh, for companies, which is a pretty significant uh, consequence if you think about th the underlying impact of that. EEOC has come out with guidance against using AI in a discriminatory manner and has brought an enforcement action. The DOJ has said the same thing around Title VII and the CFPB are they are all saying, we've got our eye on AI. We don't need a new law. We've got enough legal authority here to enforce around the edges. I actually think we see the federal side is going to be interesting to watch. We are going to see more and more action on the state and local side heading into next year. Uh, I think we can anticipate dozens and dozens of AI bills to come in to the legislature in January and February, including in California, to address a number of areas. Governors have announced executive orders examining AI policy. Local governments like the New York City City Council adopt, has adopted an AI law around employment. California is looking at adopting a responsibility framework. Governor Newsom has asked for studies on this and working groups to be stood up. But I really think we're going to start to see more and more laws develop around high-risk areas of AI, employment, finance, housing, some of the traditional areas where public policymakers see there being risk to the population. So from a US perspective, it's a very mixed bag at the moment. It continues to be a complicated regulatory environment around AI. Uh, but I think the important takeaway is that regardless of whether you're looking at it from a state, a federal, or a global level, the concept of responsible deployment of AI, responsible use, is the buzzword. Every conference I go to, every webinar I attend that involves a regulator, this is what they're talking about. Are you engaging in AI in a responsible way? And what does that look like from a practical standpoint? 
Well, responsible or trustworthy AI, those are the buzzwords. And we really first saw this concept of responsible AI back in 2019 when the OECD issued, released their AI principles. And companies that have been deep in the AI space, like autonomous vehicles companies and other companies that have been using AI behind the scenes, they've actually been aligning themselves with OECD for years and OECD lays out certain responsibility principles when using AI. We didn't really hear about this concept much until generative AI came on the scene and more companies have been using AI. Since then, we had NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, released their responsible or their risk AI risk management framework in January that have responsibility principles in there. The EU's EU AI Act have responsibility principles listed. And the White House executive order released on October 30th lists responsibility principles that the White House follows. So this concept of a responsibility framework is growing. Now, each of these frameworks have different principles. They're all sort of similar around the edges. Some are eight principles, some are 10 principles, some are seven principles. We've actually developed a Denton's responsibility a responsible AI framework that goes against five principles. I've, just, I've sort of distilled down all the responsible principle frameworks that are out there and they continue to be published and broke it down into five, which are on the right. Um, and it's important to think about these, these principles are not a checklist. What they are, what, what responsible AI governance is, is bottom line, as an organization, you are saying any use of AI we engage in, whether we build it ourselves or we go out and we get it from a vendor, we are going to view risk view the risk of that tool through the prism of these principles. And we're going to go through, and depending on the use case, we're going to weigh how the AI measures up against these principles. So principle number one around validity, reliability, and robustness, what this says is, is the AI producing valid results? This gets back to the New York lawyer using ChatGPT that created uh, uh, hallucinations. You know, if I'm the law firm looking at using the publicly available ChatGPT tool through this responsibility prism, and I go to my principle number one, I would say this tool does not consistently produce valid and reliable results for legal research. And because legal research, the use case for legal research requires absolute validity and reliability of answers, this is too high risk of a tool to use for this use case. That's how these principles get operationalized. Robustness really refers to, can it produce reliable results over time and in different circumstances and under different pressures? So this looks at data resiliency, governance, uh, data records, backup systems. Safety, security, and resiliency. This is around cybersecurity. This is around physical safety. Am I using a tool that's open source? And if it's open source, does it have security vulnerabilities that we don't know about? And as we're putting in place this enterprise tool, are we now introducing a security risk into the enterprise? So you have to look at, does it create a physical safety risk to people using the tool? Uh, and is it resilient over time? If we get hit with a ransomware attack, is this AI going to be implicated that damages our ability to deliver services? So again, another principle, security may not be an, may not be an issue for every use case. Using AI to generate email subject lines may not require a high degree of cybersecurity, but putting in place an enterprise tool that analyzes HR data, you're going to want a pretty secure protocol in place. Transparency, the third principle around transparency, explainability, and inter interpretability is the toughest principle to align with the current version of the tools that are out there. And that's because by design, you don't know how the generative AI tool came up with its recommended text, audio, or picture. You just know that you entered a prompt and it came back with a suggested generated synthetic information, but you don't know the secret sauce to how that was made. You don't know what data it was pulled from. You don't know how the model was trained and you don't know how it generated that response and in most cases, the makers of those large language models also can't answer that question. By design, 
because these models are like a neural network where we know the neurons are firing. We can't quite explain how they're generating the result. There was a great 60 Minutes interview with Jeffrey Hinton, who's seen as the godfather of AI, where he was explaining this to the interviewer, that we can't quite answer how it how these tools generate their responses, which should cause concern. So if you're measuring transparency and you're saying, so getting back to that legal research example, if you get past the validity principle uh, and you get to the question of transparency, how do we know how this tool went out and found these cases? We are starting to see more and more enterprise tools and enterprise providers actually provide more explainability. Uh, they're starting to produce what are called, <laughs> excuse me, model cards, which explain how the models were developed, how they were trained, giving a little bit more transparency. And I do think the future of AI is going to lead to more transparent, more explainable models and tools. It's actually part of the design process right now with a lot of these tools because they're realizing this is a, a challenge. Privacy and fairness as a fourth principle. Is the tool being built with privacy by design, security by design? Are you taking into account the use of synthetic data versus personal information? And are you preventing against discriminatory outcomes? How do you prevent against that? What was the diversity of the data upon which the model was trained? These are the types of questions you have to ask to analyze, are we engaging in an unfair discriminatory use of AI? And the final principle, accountability, is really about who's responsible for the AI in the end. Is there a human being in the loop? Do we have an AI governance committee that has examined the use of AI? All responsibility frameworks globally talk about human accountability as the most important element in responsible use of AI. Do not just rely on the tool to generate, create, and disseminate. You have to have a human being that is reviewing, analyzing, and placing judgment on those results. So accountability becomes critically important. So this is the, the framework. And, and one of the ways I think about responsible AI governance is brakes on a race car. And the reason why that I think that analogy is, is powerful is because when cars were developed and race cars were developed and they didn't have brakes, they could only go at a certain speed because of the danger. And when brakes were invented, guardrails were invented, cars could go faster because they had the ability to slow down where there were dangerous situations. That's how I think AI should be thought of, is that AI governance, responsible governance inside of an organization does not slow down innovation. It allows you to actually innovate faster with a clear vision of risk and a clear model to base that risk on. So what does this actually look like in practice? I'm going to give you three examples um, as we move toward the, the end of the presentation here. The first step, I think, as you're building a responsible AI governance program, so decoding this internally, one of your first steps is mapping what you're doing and what you want to do with AI. This is very similar to recommend and given the data understanding what you're currently doing. This is one of the biggest gaps organizations have right now is they've got folks in marketing or in the HR department using AI and not telling anybody that they're using AI. So it's very important early on to have conversations with every department and saying, what are you currently using? You know, this is, uh, this is all confidential. What are you currently using? Tell us how it's going. What do you want to use it for? And what are the future opportunities for you? So you're mapping both risk and opportunity. When you've got that knowledge base, you can then stand up a set of policies, a set of guardrails, a set of breaks that make sense for your organization and your risk tolerance. But before you can even get to the policy development, you've got to have a group that is dedicated to looking at AI risk. It can't just fall on, I think, the legal department's desk, or it shouldn't or privacy, or security. It's, it's got to be cross-functional because AI actually impacts every element of the business. HR may have a particular risk tolerance that the security department doesn't have, or marketing, or the C-suite. And board involvement is important. So cross-functionality, clear decision-making, a clear process. And an example of a clear process is I had a client that implemented a ticketing system 
So what they did was they rolled out a new ticketing system for every department to say, if you want to use any piece of software that has AI, you've got to submit it through this ticketing process. And this AI risk committee will answer your question, whether you, yes or no, whether you can answer uh, use this tool within one week. So they gave a very clear timeline, expected response, uh, and they have the responsibility principles built in. These are the breaks that allow them to go faster. I haven't yet received feedback about how that ticketing system is progressing, so maybe I'll report back to the group. But it's, a, it's an example of how you operationalize this process of getting visibility. Once you've stood up this responsible group, then you look at building out your policy base. And what I think you start with at the top is a responsible AI policy that basically says, as an organization, we will only deploy and use AI that aligns with these principles. And you can choose whatever principles you want. You can choose what NIST laid out in their risk management framework. You can use the OECD principles. You could use the Denton's principles. You could use any principle framework. But the important part is to document it and say that's our guiding light on using AI. That policy is very high level. You then have to think about how do we operationalize that principle-based approach for each department? What are the guardrails in HR? What are the guardrails for coding? What are the guardrails for marketing? What are the guardrails for customer experience, digital experience on the website? And each department ultimately needs to develop their own guidelines. And that's why cross-functionality is so important. Human in the loop though, that's important across the board. So do not just rely on AI for any output. There's got to be some accountability. And I think the New York example is the perfect example of where a human being in the loop would have prevented a lot of, of harm. So what getting to this idea of policy development, specific department policy developments, let's look at procurement. So the procurement department, or maybe it's legal, is looking at onboarding a new vendor that uses AI. An example of responsible AI governance in process, in operation, is a guideline, for example, that says anytime a new vendor is brought on, we must ask these AI questions. And because I think this presentation should be as practical as possible, here's a list of questions that you can start asking. And really, these questions, you can send them as part of an AI risk assessment separately. You could tack it onto an existing security process which most companies do, by the way, is they take their current security questionnaire for vendors and they tack on AI questions. And the questions that I like to ask vendors, and this is obviously just to give you some starting areas to think about, but are you actually using AI? Sort of the question number one. If so, how? What's the underlying technology? Is it powered by another company's AI? Is it built by the vendor themselves? Is it a hybrid? For example, a lot of vendors that are offering AI, when you pull back the curtain, they're using the OpenAI ChatGPT function. So you can't just look at your vendor's terms. You have to go and go a level deeper and see how the OpenAI uh, terms come in. What models are you using? Proprietary, open source. What kind of data are you actually going to be processed through the AI? Is it going to include our sensitive data? How so? Uh, and how... Most importantly, sort of five through 12, what are your processes for governance? How do you identify risk in your own AI? How is it trained? How can we mitigate against discriminatory outcomes? How do you ensure that it doesn't produce invalid results? Going back to that uh, validity and reliability principle. How do you ensure security and privacy? And what are your governance standards? So, this is an example of responsible AI in operation, the procurement department has a standard that before you bring on a vendor, you got to send these questions. Another example of what the procurement department can roll out is sample vendor language. So in the data privacy space, we have data protection addendums, DPAs that are attached to most agreements. And I'm sure many or all, all of you have seen these. Sometimes you see a security addendum. Well, we're increasingly potentially seeing AI addendums or AI language. The So just as another example, these are just example terms that 
I've seen used and sometimes will use uh, is, well, maybe the procurement department has specific contract language that has to go into every contract. That's an example of a guardrail, a responsible principle put into action. So for example, here, number one is saying, vendor, if you're going to use a, if you're going to use AI, you need to do so in a commercially responsible and trustworthy. There are those buzzwords uh, and complies with all applicable laws, including but not limited to the NIST risk management framework. And this is not an uncommon approach. For example, in cybersecurity, you'll often see references to the NIST cybersecurity framework or another cybersecurity framework. Uh, so that's the same sort of concept here. Number two is at a minimum, your governance procedures should include the following. Acceptable tolerances, monitoring and periodic reviews. And this is all highly contextual. You can, you can change these depending on the vendor. Number three, you're going to have to give us documentation, prov providing information about the model, how it was trained, and other appropriate information. This gets back to transparency, explainability, validity, getting back to your responsibility principles. Don't use AI to generate content without our approval. Don't disclose our inputs to other third parties and don't use it to train your model. Maybe that's your policy. We're starting to see more enterprise tools say we will not train our model based on your data. So this is an example of terms that you can impose, but we're starting to see enterprise terms change over time as well. For example, both Microsoft and Adobe have changed their terms relating to some AI products to say that they'll fully indemnify you if you get hit with a copyright lawsuit based on the use of their tools. So the, the sense of these vendor tools are changing the EU has released model AI procurement clauses to align with the EU AI Act. So this issue of contract language is developing, but this gives you, gives you an example of a department level policy that you say any use of AI has to have certain contract provisions in place. So that just gives you an example of what the department level policies look like. But really when we think about in the end, how are we decoding responsible AI governance? We're taking this large concept of AI's got a lot of risk and it's got a lot of promise, but operationally, practically, how do we not block AI, but how do we harness AI in a way that's responsible? How do we build guardrails in place to ensure our use of AI is responsible? And that's the underlying principle of responsible AI governance. It starts at the Baseline level, knowledge, then you build the governance structure, then you have board involvement. And so your first step always in building a responsible AI governance structure is to map your existing use cases. You have to know what people are doing. The most common risk I see uh, in working with clients is employees using generative AI tools and not telling anyone that they're using them. So from an acceptable use guideline, you need to know who's using it and the benefits uh, that you're getting from that. You have to also cultivate a culture of responsible AI governance throughout the organization. This includes training within department levels to have them understand what are the risks, what are the benefits of AI, what do we need to keep our eyes peeled for. I think the most important takeaway is that you have immediate risks around uses of generative AI that employees are doing, but you also have to go deeper and build the larger framework. And that's what takes the most work. And that's what takes the most buy-in from the C-suite and from the board, which is we're gonna have a dedicated governance structure. We're going to be disciplined in how we apply it. And we're gonna be consistent in whether we give the green light or the red light to new tools. And that risk profile, your tolerance for risk and what that structure looks like is going to change as the AI tools change. But I think if you build a responsible AI governance program, that's flexible, that's not dedicated to a particular technology, but is flexible across this concept of artificial intelligence. That's what will put you in the best position for the future. And you won't have to recreate the wheel every time there's an advancement in the technology. The final key takeaway, and this is the most challenging for all of us because everyone's busy and everyone's got multiple uh, hats they're wearing is staying informed not only on the regulatory developments, which will obviously get a lot of headlines, 
but also on the technology developments and what tools are being offered. These enterprise tools especially are changing daily. There is a new tool being offered daily. There are tweaks being made. There's a paid version being offered that is a little bit more nimble. And so the tool that you are looking at today may not be the best tool for your organization in a week from now. That's why that AI risk committee is so important because part of that risk committee structure is a knowledge component, is in an informing the committee about developments in AI. And it's important to have people as part of that committee who are staying close to this on a daily basis, but you don't want to be buying tools that are going to be outdated uh, in several months because we're sitting on that Gartner hype cycle. So knowledge is really an important part and it's a very difficult part of compliance. So with that, uh, John, I know we're, we're just about up on time, but I'm happy to open it up to if, if anyone has some questions. We did get a few questions through the chat that we answered throughout, but happy to open the floor as well. All right, great. Yeah, this, this was a excellent presentation. And if anyone uh, has questions, like Peter said, we've got a couple of minutes left. So feel free to go ahead and ask them directly. We've answered all their questions, John, on AI <laughs> governance. It's all it's all resolved. It's all clear. Yeah. It's all clear. It's going away. I do have one quick question for you. In terms of individuals' use of AI, these chat GPTs and other things uh, in in the course of their work separate from enterprise. Have you seen any issues pop up organizationally or regulations that have been imposed to address these, or is it currently just too young um, in, in the wild, I guess, right now? Yeah, from a regulatory standpoint, we really haven't. We, we see the FTC and the EEOC, for example, say don't use it, that violates existing federal law, and we see state laws take a similar approach. Your biggest risk in that space is employees using it in a way where they're entering in confidential information, trade secrets, IP protected information or personal information. And they're using a tool where the terms say the third party can use whatever inputs go in to train their model. And for example, that you could be risking trade secret protection because you're giving access to a third party. So acceptable use guidelines are your best tool right now outline very clearly what is permissible, what isn't permissible, or do a hard block. Say you can't use any generative AI tool for work purposes, but you wanna be very clear to the employees what's expected, what they can use it for, what they can't. It's very hard to block people completely from using these tools because they're so readily accessible through browsers and through the app store, but you can put expectations and enforce those expectations through a traditional acceptable use policy that is pretty common across use of any software that's approved or not approved. So that's really your best method right now. We'll see if the regulations get there, but the regulations are more focused on organizational liability than individual risk. Thank you. Well, with that, John, uh, it's been a pleasure. I know we had a several questions that come up in the chat asking if the slide deck will be made available. And my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that it will be made available for everyone. So if yep. folks weren't able to scribble down the notes, we'll we'll send through uh, send through the slide deck. And of course, if anyone does have questions offline, happy to chat as well. All right. Sounds good. Thanks again, Peter, for a great presentation and um, appreciate everyone joining. All right. Thank you. Thanks.